Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, a very warm welcome to uh, to everyone who's joined us for today's presentation. Uh, my name's John Norman. I'm uh, head of marketing here at Optivium and uh, and moderator for today's webinar, uh, which is multi-parameter optimization in practice, in in which we will demonstrate how you can quickly find high-quality compounds uh, for your projects. Okay, so uh, now it's uh, it's high time that we uh, hand it over to our presenters, who are our host, Tim Hom, uh, Director of Commercial Strategy and Business Development, and today's presenter, Ed Champness, our CSO and Company Director. So, uh, Tim, without further ado, I will now hand things over to you. Thank you for the kind introduction, John. It is my pleasure to host today's webinar, and it's great to see all of you joining us today. To get us started, please let me introduce today's speaker, Ed Champness. Ed is co-founder and chief scientific officer at Optivium and a trained mathematician. Ed has devoted many years of his working career with predictive modeling, decision support, and user interface design in the area of drug discovery. Today, Ed will discuss key challenges relating to the multi-objective optimization nature of drug discovery along with how to address these using Optibrium Stardrop software. With that, I would like to hand over to you, Ed. Thank you very much, Tim, for that confirmation. Apologies, I was, I was well into my stride there. Um, so as, as John kindly said at the very beginning, um, my intention today is to really talk about multi-parameter optimization um, with a, obviously a key focus here on drug discovery. I'm gonna start off by thinking about some of the challenges we face in drug discovery. Uh, before then going in to think about some of the different approaches we can take as we consider all the properties that are important to us when we're making decisions. Um, I'm going to touch on this sort of theme of not just the quality of the compounds that we pick out through MPO, but also how we select compounds taking diversity into consideration, and then give an example of this in, in, a, in a case study that we've done, um, which is sort of around the idea of trying to focus as quickly and effectively as, as possible within a lead optimization project. I'm then going to give a quick demonstration of this in practice within our Stardrop software, just sort of putting some of what I've described in my presentation into context before wrapping up with, with one or two conclusions. And as John has, has said at the beginning, if, if anyone has any questions, please type them into the panel and I'll be very happy to address them at the end. So in terms of the challenges of drug discovery, um, I guess drug discovery itself is, is a, a multi-parameter optimization challenge uh, in its own right. Um, what we're trying to do is identify chemistries that have an optimal balance of properties. And it's sort of very much simplified in my little sort of schematic up in the top right here, um, where what we often do when we're searching for our hits or leads is look for regions of chemistry where we can get good potency. But of course, what we ultimately need to do is find the region of that chemistry space where we can also achieve a balance in terms of the safety profile, absorption, stability, solubility, and many other properties, because that's the sweet spot where we're going to potentially find our drug. And of course, we want to identify as quickly as possible if we're in a situation where we can't achieve this balance. Again, very much simplified in the bottom right there where we may well find some nice potent compounds um, in our sort of early screening, but if we can't achieve a balance of the other properties we need, we're not going to develop a successful drug. And the industry mantra around this is fail fast and fail cheap. Of course, we, we don't want to fail at all. What we do want to do is think about the confidence we can have in such a big decision. Um, because as I'll be touching on sort of in my, my later sort of parts of today's talk, um, the confidence we can have in our decisions is very much affected by the uncertainty in the data that we're working with. And of course, the key thing we don't want to do is miss opportunities as a result of uh, having low quality or uncertain data that we're working with. So one of the challenges we're, we're faced with is what I call data overload. Actually, the, the screen here has only got a small number of compounds and properties on it, but actually generating tens, hundreds of thousands of data points when we're working uh, with virtual compounds and predictive models is, is trivial. We can do this in a matter of minutes. But of course, having vast numbers of, of data points is maybe interesting, but actually it's only valuable if we can use these to drive effective decisions. And of course, even if we're not working with predictive models or, or virtual compounds, we're working at sort of much smaller scale. We can still generate hundreds or thousands of data points through experimental assays on using compounds that we've synthesized. Um, this whole process will sort of be more of an investment in, in time and resources to, to get these data points. 
we still have exactly the same question to answer. How do we use these um, to make decisions? How do we use these to drive our projects forward? And we can always throw the data we've got at um, different ways of visualizing, whether that's heat maps or, in this case, an almost gratuitous 3D chart. I've got three axes, of three properties, three dimensions of information there. I've got colors, I've got sizes. I even made it spin just to sort of make it look fancy. So I can get many dimensions of information into a visualization, but I'm unlikely to be able to point to that and say, there we go, that, that's my drug. So um, visualization is, is clearly important for helping us look for patterns in our data, but it, it's certainly not enough. A second challenge we have is the uncertainty in the data we're working with. So we start with the experimental side of things. When we take our assay measurements, we have experimental variability in those data. Um, if we think about sort of single measurements we make for something like uh, potency, sort of measuring a, a KI, we may have an error of sort of between sort of a factor of two and two to five, um, which sort of results in a sort of peak error of something between 0.3 and 0.7 log units of error. If we measure multiple replicates, then we can calculate a mean and a standard error in that mean. And I've got a sort of a little chart over on the right here to exemplify that. So I've just called it property. It doesn't really matter what the property is, but the vertical dotted lines show us the different measurements that we've made for that property. And we can use those measurements in order to work out the sort of the shape of the distribution. So we can work out a mean value and, and the confidence we, we can have in, in, in that. If we think about statistical data, so we think about the in silico side of things, well, whenever we use QSOM models or predictive models, um, we can get out a prediction, but we'll also get out some error with that prediction. So the, the size of that error in the prediction is something we'd estimate when we validate the model that we've built. So when we feed um, independent data into the model, we can get an idea of how good it is at making predictions. Um, even properties like log p, where we can build very high quality QSOM models, we're still going to end up with errors of sort of 0.4 to 0.5 log units. The solubility it might be sort of a little bit higher than that. It's a harder property to model in sort of 0.7, 0.8 log units. When it comes to something like potency, well, some, some targets are, are very hard to model, um, but even good models of potency, we're still looking at sort of getting on for a, a log unit of error. We also need to consider the domain of applicability of the model. So it's not just a case of saying, well, this model always predicts within these bounds. That's only the case if you're predicting for a molecule um, which is within that domain of applicability, of applicability. So similar enough to those compounds that we use to build the model in the first place. If we're outside of the domain of applicability, well, the model may well come up with a good prediction, but we have no evidence to support that. So um, we can't assume that the, the, the prediction is, is valid and we wouldn't want to uh, use that with, with any confidence in our decision making. Another aspect of this, of course, is the relevance of the, the data to the actual sort of problem of interest to us, because of course all sources of data in drug discovery are themselves models of the, the ultimate sort of human patient in which we that we we care about, so whether that's in silica predictions in vitro or in vivo um, assays. And what we have, of course, is a, an inference or a translation problem between what it is we're actually measuring and what it is we're particularly interested in. So I've got an example here of this sort of from a paper over 20 years ago in terms of measuring CACO2 permeation and considering its relationship to human intestinal absorption. Now, of course, we can see from this that you wouldn't ever want to draw a line through this and say, I can see a relationship there. But I'm going to come back to this a little bit later to think about how we can use this sort of information as part of our decision making in, in an effective way. Okay, so I was saying really that there are, I'm going to talk through a number of different approaches we can use for MPO and drug discovery, but to start that off, I really wanted to touch on a few of really sort of opinions on, or my own personal opinions on some of the requirements we should have for any approach that we take. Um, the first of these is that the approach should be interpretable. So we want our approach to MPO to be easy to understand in terms of the priorities that it produces. Um, and also easy to interpret so that we can feed it back into our decisions about how to improve compounds chances of success. We want the approach we use to be flexible. Clearly all drug discovery projects are different, so we need to be able to define criteria that de depending upon the thera therapeutic objectives of the project. 
And within that, we also want to take into account the relative importance of the different endpoints to the success of the project. And of course, this is something that may well change during the life cycle of a project. It goes back to the point about flexibility. And finally, whatever approach we want, uh, we, we use, we want to take into account the uncertainty in our data, in particular to help us avoid missed opportunities. So there are many different approaches that have been applied for MPO in drug discovery. Whether that's rules of thumb, filtering, calculated metrics, free to optimization, desirability functions, probabilistic scoring. Um, I'm actually going to sort of give sort of a brief overview of three or four of these, the ones I've got highlighted here. But if you want a detailed review of, of all of these different approaches, I've, I've put a reference up here that I'll I'll show again at the end in my in my conclusions. If, you, if you'd like to sort of dive into them in a bit more detail. But starting with rules of thumb, um, I really had to touch on first the, the most famous of these, which is Lipinski's rule of five for oral absorption. So it's a, a very simple rule of thumb based upon looking at log P, the number of hydrogen bond donors and acceptors and molecular weight, and looking for compounds that um, ideally don't violate any, more than one of those particular rules. So very simple to, to see and apply, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Another example is from Hughes and his colleagues exploring uh, the risk of adverse outcomes in in vivo toleration studies, and this was based on just just two very simple properties. And many other approaches um, have been proposed. And again, I've got a reference here for a paper uh, by Garcia Sosa and his his colleagues. Um, anyone that like to to dig into that. But the key thing about all of these, they are very easy to apply and to interpret. But it's important to remember that each of them is tailored to very specific objectives. So each of them is um, has a definite lack of flexibility. And there's also, I mean, there's a real risk of applying these too rigidly. So sort of by way of an example, if we think about how predictive rules of thumb are, if I take Lipinski's rule of five and apply it to about 1200 marketed drugs, of course, the rule of five is supposed to be focusing on um, orally administered drugs. Um, but if I apply it to all the drugs, we can see that um, as a general rule, most of them pass, whether they're oral or non-oral drugs. Um, I think what's particularly interesting if you think about the oral drugs that have passed, um, although a significant proportion of them pass as opposed to fail, that's 59 uh, drugs there that um, if these criteria had been used to triage compounds too early on, may well have been overlooked. Um, and so I, I think it's fair to say from this, this approach isn't particularly specific, nor is it sensitive. So it needs to be used judiciously for the right purposes. An alternative approach we can take is filtering. So the nice thing about filtering is it helps us do, helps us deal with complex problems and reduce them to something that's more manageable. And of course, we as human beings don't deal with large volumes of data in our heads very easily. Um, to exemplify the way filtering works, I've got a crude example here where I've got some lumps of coal and hidden within them is a diamond. And the way we'd apply um, filtering in drug discovery, we pretended that diamond was the drug we were looking for. What we do is come along with our perhaps most important property. In this case, I've, I've chosen potency and said that well, I've got a filter for this. So I know I need a potency of above this level. I can apply my filter and use that to discard compounds so I've got a smaller set um, to, to deal with, to, to focus on. And of course, I can apply successive filters, one after the other. So I've got absorption, metabolic stability in this case. Each time I apply them, a smaller and smaller problem space to manage. Of course, what I hope is that out of the end, comes my diamond. And I'm sure there's not a single person listening to this webinar who thinks that's how easy drug discovery is. I can just apply some filters and then I'll get my drug at the end. But there's a few important things to bear in mind. One, one is that we don't know that there was a, uh, a drug there or a diamond in this set to start with. And if there was, we don't know whether it was potentially discarded somewhere along the way. There's also a risk that the wrong thing is going to come out at the end. And the reason for this is that any filtering we uh, apply is going to compound any error we have in our data. So if we pretended that all the data we work with in this drug discovery is 90% accurate, and I think you would agree, all agree that that would be a luxurious position to be in, by the time we've applied filters for five properties that are 90% accurate, the overall filtering system is only 59% accurate. If we had 10 filters, which is still not a very large number of properties to deal with, we're down to 35% overall accuracy. So by that point, we're more likely to get things wrong than we are to get them right. So it's not to say that you can't apply filtering, but given the uncertainty in the data, it needs to be used very carefully. 
if we think about that question I sort of raised earlier around the relevance of data and what impact a particular value has on the outcome that we're interested in, going back to CACO2 permeation, um, our interest, of course, was in human intestinal absorption. And what we really wanted to do is find compounds that achieve uh, HIA of greater than 50%. Now, whilst the data we have available that were sort of from, the, from this study don't allow us to create a, a nice correlation between CACO2 permeation and HIA, what they do show us is actually there is a, a nice relationship if we consider the, the proportion of compounds with different ranges of CACO2 um, uh, permeation measurements relative to what we're ultimately looking for. If we, if we look at this, the chart over on the left hand side, we can see that essentially all of the compounds which have a high um, um, permeation measurement um, have good human intestinal absorption. So this allows us to say that actually if I see a high value, that's really good, that's good for my project. And whereas if I see a low value, I, I can't necessarily tell one way or the other. So this allows us to create a function to represent this. And this is this is a desirability function. It's a way of translating the value that comes out of the, uh, the CACO2 permeation measurements into a reflection of what we're really looking for in terms of human intestinal absorption. And the last method I want to describe is probabilistic scoring. So this is our own approach for multi-parameter optimization. And it's based upon defining a profile of the properties that we're looking for. So over on the left-hand side here, we can see a series of properties that I've put into my scoring profile. For each of those properties, I've defined what I'm looking for, essentially a desirability function. I've said I would like a value in this particular range above a certain threshold or this particular category of data. Um, for each of those properties, I'm also defining a relative importance. So I'm thinking about which of those properties are absolutely critical for success and which of those down at the bottom of the list am I willing to trade off in order to get the most important properties right. So as I said, every, for each one of those properties, we have one of these desirability functions applied. Um, the more important the properties, the property is, the more heavily I want to penalize compounds that fail to meet the criteria I'm looking for. But the desirability function allows me to reflect um, the range of interest. So probabilistic scoring enables me to pull together property data, whether that's experimental or predicted, our criteria for success, including the relative importances of the properties, and also the uncertainties in the data to generate an overall score. And the score itself is a, a probability, a likelihood of success. Of course, because I've pulled together uncertain data, my calculation here, I'm also going to end up with a confidence in the score. But we can use this as when we're thinking about how to make decisions on the basis of the scores that we generate. So as a very simple example, which I'll sort of show again sort of in the live demonstration, in this case, I've got a simple example with 34 compounds that I've scored against a profile. And the chart at the bottom is something we typically refer to as a snake plot. This is a plot for showing the scores of our compounds, which are ordered from best to worst along the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we show the score. And importantly, we always show the error bars to give us an idea of the confidence we can have in that overall score. And if you think about when we're using predicted data, the more predicted data we're using, the greater those error bars are likely to be. So these error bars help us to see that, of course, we always get a top scoring compound, but essentially those top five compounds really can't be separated with any confidence whatsoever, given the data that we've got available at the moment. But if we did want to triage this data set, we could still say with confidence that about the bottom 50% are significantly less likely to be successful than those top scoring compounds. There's absolutely no overlap even between the tops of their error bars and the bottoms of the error bars of those top scoring compounds. So we could triage these out of the set with confidence. And of course, what it leaves is a, a gray region, those compounds in the middle for which we don't yet have good enough data to distinguish them from potentially being really good compounds or from those we might discard. And these really represent the potential missed opportunities, the compounds we wouldn't want to discard yet. We want to sample these um, and make sure we've got better data before we make a decision one way or the other. So we can use our, our scoring um, really to guide that redesign process as we're thinking about sort of the overall chance of success. Um, so on the left-hand side here, you can see I've got sort of a, much, a large data set here, which I've scored. 
but I've picked out a couple of examples from that on, in our card view to highlight the fact they've both got very similar scores of around sort of 0 0.3, 0 0.4, sorry, 0 0.03, 0 0.04, so three or four percent chance of being successful. But for very, very different reasons, we can see the compound on the left here has great potency, peak I is above nine, but actually because of its high solubility and uh, consequently low, sorry, high log P, apologies, and low solubility, it's been quite heavily penalized, and therefore ends up with a low score. On the other hand, the compound to the right does really well in terms of the, the overall balance of acne and physicochemical properties, but its lower potency, so a peak I of around seven, results in it having similar score. So depending upon what potential there is for us to um, um, sort of do design around our compounds, the scores and this, this breakdown of how different properties have contributed to them enables us to think about the design process we might go through uh, in order to come up with compounds that are going to have a better overall balance of properties. Now, of course, that's focusing on the overall quality of the compounds, but if we want to bring diversity into it as well, um, in this case, I'm going to use uh, in both my case study and my demo a little bit later and think about chemical space. Um, so that we can explore trends across chemical diversity. So I've got a, an example chemical space plot here. And a chemical space plot is a qualitative representation of the similarities of all the compounds in a set. Um, the, each of the points in this represents a single compound, and any two points which are close together are very similar chemical structures. Of course, compounds that are further away are, are more diverse. And of course, there are many dimensions of information squashed down into this, 2D or if you wanted 3D representation of chemical space. So as I said, it's very much qualitative, but you can get a feel from interacting with it to see that it's laying out similar compounds together. What I've done here is color the chemical space based upon my scores um, so that the, the lowest scoring compounds are colored red, the highest scoring compounds are colored yellow. So it makes it very easy for me to pick out hotspots, so regions within the chemical space where I've got a much greater proportion high scoring compounds, because these obviously are much more valuable areas for me to explore in, in greater detail. But if I want to think about mitigating risk, I wouldn't necessarily want to put all my eggs in one basket and focus just on that one area of space. What I'd probably want to do is sample other regions of space. So you can see here when I pull up my snake plot and select a series of the top scoring compounds, by allowing myself to select a little way down that snake, um, what I can do is introduce compounds into my selection that still have sort of better scores than many others that start taking, allowing me to explore a wider range of chemical space so that I can sort of keep my options open until I, I really am sure that I've got, I found the region in which I want to focus. So in terms of a case study um, sort of and thinking about applying multi-parameter optimization to make a difference um, to a drug discovery project, um, uh, this case study is called Reducing Synthesis Cycles in Lead Optimization and was carried out with a customer who asked us to carry out this study retrospectively. Now, of course, it's easy. Everyone has 2020 vision in, in hindsight. However, we carried out this study blind. But for the sake of me explaining what we did, I'm going to lay out a picture of what the customer had done um, and explain what that meant in terms of the steps we took. But all the steps we actually took we carried out with no information whatsoever. We were asked to sort of work our way through it as though we were starting from scratch. And they fed us the information as we asked for it to demonstrate where we could have achieved or what we could have achieved applying NPO compared to the way that the project had originally gone. So the challenge of the project had been to develop an orally active compound for a CNS target. And the project had been defined around a chemical space which comprised just over 3,000 compounds. This was a library that the uh, the customer had synthesized and put through some, some potency screening. So in terms of what the project team themselves had done in the first year of their work, um, we can see of the, of the whole library that they had focused their attention on the points that I've highlighted in blue. So there's a definite area of focus where they've been sort of drawn into, particularly as you can see, because of the, the high potency of the compounds. And indeed, some of those compounds had very nice um, bioavailability. Some of them had very nice brain barrier penetration. None of them, even none, none, none of them managed to achieve a balance of both bioavailability and blood brain barrier penetration. So this, this was very frustrating to them. 
when we did a retrospective sort of analysis later on, as they, they told us about this after we completed our, our project, we were able to highlight by um, applying scoring to, to that whole set of compounds, the fact that the region they'd really focused on generally had poor overall ADNI properties. And on the basis of this in silico analysis, they probably wouldn't have invested quite so much time despite the high potency of those compounds. They wouldn't have discussed it outright, but probably wouldn't have focused so intently there. In the second year of the project, um, the green points highlight where their, their different areas of focus were. were. Um, and again, they sort of focused in on areas where they could find very nicely potent compounds, um, where there was a slightly better balance of absorption and blood brain barrier penetration, but still nothing that could be considered to be good enough. So as far as the project was concerned, they'd invested two years in this. Um, there was nowhere obvious to go next. Indeed, essentially the cost so far had been the synthesis of all 3000 compounds and testing for IC50s. They tested 400 of these compounds for in vitro ADME and 70 compounds tested in vivo. They were essentially intending to can the project, but they wanted to know, could they have got to the same conclusions quicker and more effectively? So what we described for them and took them through was a process whereby we started off with in silico ADME profiling, so using some sort of QSAR models predicting ADME and physicochemical properties, which we could then feed, feed those predictions into um, a scoring profile, with the scoring profile tuned towards looking for oral absorption and CNS penetration. So we can see at the top of the profile, I've got solubility, absorption, blood brain penetration. Having scored all the compounds, we then selected 10% of them, so about 300 compounds. Um, obviously we wanted good scoring compounds, but with a, a strong bias towards diversity, we wanted to sample the whole space, so as, as diverse a sample as we could of good compounds across that space. We told them we would then synthesize and measure in vitro potency for those 300 compounds, so that we could then rescore them but with the potency added into that profile. So we asked for a potency of above eight and added that into the profile that we had there so that we could then make a further selection of 25 compounds, this time with much stronger bias towards um, the score. So we didn't want to ignore diversity altogether, um, but this time we really wanted the, the top scoring compounds to, to take on to, to further studies. What we achieved by taking this holistic approach and applying MPO from the very start was that we essentially managed to paint the same picture that they'd, they'd come up with. So over on the right here, you can see we managed to sample the, the different areas of space over on the right where there were good potencies, but they could never achieve a balance in terms of the absorption or blood brain barrier penetration. But to get this picture, we'd only had to synthesize or suggest they synthesize a small proportion of the compounds and screen a small proportion of them do much less testing. So it's a far more efficient way to achieve um, the same result. But importantly, what we really highlighted for them was actually there was a different area of chemistry which actually had really good potential. The area of chemistry over on the left there is, is where we would have suggested they, they really focus their attention. Now, this would be an even better case study if I could tell you that they went away and carried on exploring there because they did go back into the project. They had a new lease of life. They decided to reinvest in it. Um, it'd be lovely if I could tell you that a drug came out of that, that exploration. Unfortunately, um, being at the one end of the process, we, we aren't often privy to what our customers do with, with our Stardrop software or the results they achieve with it. Um, we do know that they, they sort of uh, investigations had them well into development. Um, so clearly it gave the project a new lease of life, um, but it's not the perfect case study in that I can tell you that it went all the way through. I'm, I'm sort of ever hopeful we might get that kind of feedback from customers one day, but it's, it's not very common. So I want to give a very brief demonstration just to show some of this in practice, really to show just how simply we can use MPO, uh, despite the fact that sort of some, sometimes, or some will see it as complex mathematics wrapped around um, what's already fairly complex data, but actually we can apply it very simply and easily to, to drive our decisions. So to do that, I've got here Stardrop, in which I've got a, a very small project. I've got a project with uh, just under 300 uh, compounds. Um, the target I'm focus, focusing on for these compounds is 5-HT1A, and what I've got in this data set are the compounds sorted uh, 
from top to bottom in terms of the potency. So we can see at the top here some nice potent compounds. Indeed, over on the left here, I've got a histogram which shows the distribution of the potency value. So you can see there's, there's some, some nice potent compounds, but there's quite a wide distribution of them. The compounds in this particular data set have been split into six different uh, chemotypes. And the, the question I'm going to try and answer here is which of the chemotypes should we focus on um, in terms of further studies and, and further investigation? So how should we how should we sort of start triaging uh, these, these different compounds? So not just looking for one or two compounds, but thinking about them as, as chemistries. Um, in my dashboard over here to the right, I've got a box plot which I've created based upon the potency data where each of the different chemotypes um, so it is split up by each of the different chemotypes, so I can see the distribution of potencies across each of them. Um, we can see there's some nice potent compounds across most of them, but actually for quite a few of these, the potent compounds are outliers, and actually it's only really the indenols where we've got this sort of nice high mean value. So nearly all of the indenols have a, a good potency value except for one or two outliers. So in terms of potency, the indenols are definitely the most promising area of focus. I've also got in my dashboard a chemical space um, plot. Um, in this case, it's it's based upon these 300 compounds, but I've coloured it um, based on the different chemistries, just so you can get a feel for this sort of this qualities representation has still managed to spread out uh, the six different chemistries. The the series flags weren't used to create this. It's based purely upon the chemical structures. But when I colour it based upon the series flags, you can see we get some nice distinct clusters here. So um, you can sort of see our uh, indenols here, and if I select these, you can see these these relate to what we've got um, within our data set here. So all of these visualizations are highly interactive and sort of linked up to our data set. So whatever I interact with in one, I can see in all of the others. But in terms of the chemical space, what I'm going to do here um, is sort of rather than just try and pick out compounds individually as I'm looking at it, I'm going to color it on the basis of the potency. So what I'd like to do is um, sort of get an idea of whether or not there are sort of particular hotspots um, within the space. So what I'm going to say is anything with a PKI less than about seven and a half, I'm going to colour red. Anything higher than that would be yellow. So this allows us to start to see that actually there, there are some sort of little hot hotspots in various places, but there's two distinct clusters sort of here which look particularly promising. And of course we we know we've already seen that the indenols tend to be particularly potent. So this sort of largely refers to those those indenols. Um, but we can see there is potential in sort of other areas of space from this kind of visualization too. But of course, the, the talk today was on multi-parameter optimization, not just focusing on, on the potency. So what I'm going to do is sort of wrap a number of other properties into my thinking. So I'm just going to minimize my dashboard for a second, sort of highlight the fact that I've got a number of other properties in this table that I calculated using um, sort of ad ADNI QSAR models or physicochemical predictions. So I've got some solubility, some log P, 2D6, 2C9, herb affinity, um, absorption, blood brain barrier penetration, and so on in my table. Um, all of those predicted properties, we also have an estimate of the confidence you can have in those predictions. I mentioned uncertainty being an important thing. If I sort of toggle this on for a second, you can see that every one of those solubilities is not just a predicted log S, these are micromolar values, um, but I've also got an estimate of the error, which is um, sort of between 0.7 and 1 log unit in most cases. And again, for, for log P, it's around sort of 0.4. So all of the predictions have an estimate of the, um, the, the error associated with them that we can wrap into our decisions. And the same goes for our categorical properties where we get a probability of, of that being the correct category. For our measured data, you'll also see I've got an estimate of the error there. In this case, I, I've taken a sort of a, a little bit of a, a gamble and, and made a guess for myself based upon the fact that I'm um, thinking about potency measurements, so measurements in KIs I've assumed in this case have been sort of a two-fold error um, in, in the assay. Uh, and so this has resulted in a, an error of about 0.3 log units when I've converted that to a PKI. So in this case, because I don't, I don't know the assay, that may be overly optimistic or perhaps slightly pessimistic. Um, but it's best to put some kind of estimation there than assume that these data are perfect and have no error at all. Because there's one thing I know for certain, which is that there wasn't no error whatsoever. This is probably not too bad a reflection of reality. So these, these numbers are there. I sort of toggle them on and off just because it's more complex to see double the numbers there, but they're, they're always there behind all the data that we're working with. We're going to wrap those into our um, MPO scores. So to pull these data together, um, I'm going to use scoring. 
Um, we have a few built-in scoring profiles in StarDrop, and I'm going to, for the sake of sort of expediency, grab one of those. So we've got one of these profiles for oral CNS scoring profile. Um, and in this particular case, um, the profile is something that we provide as an example with StarDrop. It may not be the right profile for an oral CNS project, but it's a starting point for anyone who wants to get going and think about how to put a profile together. So this example profile is based on having good solubility, good absorption, reasonable log P, blood brain barrier penetration, and so on. But of course, what I want to do is include in this, this, this is all based on predicted data, I want to include my measured data or the potency as well. So I'm going to drag that into the profile. And then I want to tell Stardrop what it is that I'd like from that property. So um, what I could do is simply say, well, I'd like a peak high above eight. That'd be a simple way to set a, a threshold for this and say, well, that's pretty important. But I can very easily define a slightly more sophisticated desirability function. So if I double click this, um, it allows me to create whatever function represents what I'm looking for from this property. Now the importance that I give the property determines the kind of penalty that will be applied. The lower the importance, the smaller the penalty that will apply. And likewise for this, because it's an important property, I'm going to set a pretty high importance. I'm actually going to set it a bit more manually by specifying the function I want, because what I'd like to do is have compounds with a PKI above eight. As I drop below eight, I'd like to penalize them more and more until I get down to about seven. And then from seven and below, I'm gonna say, well, I've got a very low chance of success, maybe only 5% chance of success, even if everything else is perfect, once I'm down to a PKI of about seven. So I can insert a range here from seven to eight. And when I'm down at the seven end of the range, I can say I've got a 5% chance of success. When I'm up at eight, I'll be successful. If everything else is perfect about this compound, I'll be successful if the PKI is eight or above. I'll say okay to that. Um, I'm going to tidy up this little bottom end of the range to make sure everything below seven also gets penalized in exactly the same way. Now I have my desirability function that I can use to, to score that particular the property within the overall um, scoring. So this now is a very slightly different profile. This is my potent. Um, I think we, we had a small yeah, technical sure. glitch, so people probably haven't seen how you were drawing the uh, desirability function. Okay, in which case I, I will show you briefly again. So I, I highlighted the fact we can create these functions simply by editing them in place. But if I double click them, I can pull up an editor that lets me create any piecewise linear function that I like. In, in this particular case, I inserted a range, and the range I inserted went from seven to eight, where I said, well, once I'm down at seven, I've probably only got a 5% chance of success. Once I'm up at one, um, sorry, once I'm up at eight, I'm, I'm gonna be successful if everything else about my compound is, is perfect. So I can create as complex a function within this editor as I like. But in this case, I've set up a fairly simple trend really to reflect the like. In fact, I'd like to be above eight with increasing penalty down to seven as I, I drop below that. So with my profile, um, I've renamed it to potent plus oral CNS scoring profile. And if I click this go button here, I can score all my compounds. So now I've got a new column in my data set. So every compound has a score, which is a value between zero and one, indicating how likely this compound is to be successful, given what I'm looking for, and given the data available and the uncertainties in those data. So my most potent compound has a chance, about a 12% chance of being successful. The second most potent compound has got a chance sort of above 30%. So that's looking very promising. Um, and just scanning down the list, if I get down to this fifth most potent compound here, it's got a 36% chance of success, where if I look at these histogram bars showing me the contributions of the different properties to the overall score, it's really just the this pink bar here, the Herg affinity, um, which is letting this compound down. So if I wanted to try and improve this particular amino tetraline further, um, I may well focus on Herg affinity, but of course I'd want to try and make improvements there without um, doing anything which is detrimental to, to all the other properties. But of course I'm not interested in just individual compounds. I mentioned at the beginning I was interested in looking for which of the different series on which to focus my attention. Um, so what I'm going to do is switch into Stardrop's card view, which is just a different way of looking at the same compounds and data. Every card here represents one of the rows in the data set. The card view gives me a lot more flexibility for moving my ideas around, uh, making comparisons between compounds as I wish. Um, what I can also use it to do is group compounds together. So I could start 
grouping my compounds based upon similarities in their structures. But um, even with a small data set like this, uh, I've only got 300 compounds, you don't want to see me stack all 300 of them manually. Um, so what I'm going to do is stack them automatically on the basis of that series flag so I can make comparisons between the overall series. So when I do this, if I sort of zoom in on, on one of the stacks that's been created, I can see on the front of that stack the distribution of the potency values um, for all the compounds in that stack. I can also see the distributions of the scores as well. So I can get a feel for how the scores of those, those compounds are across that, that complete stack. So these six stacks now represent all my compounds which have, have been scored. And if I bring back my, um, my dashboard, um, we can see my, my, my charts that sort of relate to these. And of course, selecting any one of these, we can see how that relates to my, my chemical space. And of course, these six stacks are the same as the, the six boxes that I've got here. Um, but what I want to do is, in my visualization, create one of these snake plots. So I go to my charts and choose a snake plot. I can now see the distribution of all the scores um, in this particular data set. And of course, most of the score, most of the um, components of these scores are predicted values. So there's big error bars around uh, most of these points. Um, but I can still pick out the fact that if I look at my top scoring compound with a score of sort of above 0.4, the bottom end of its error bar, there are probably about 100 compounds um, whose error bars sort of overlap with that. So in terms of a sort of a first approach to um, making a selection from here, what I might do is pick out about 100 compounds, so I'll just sort of draw around them, um, so that I can then see which of the different chemical series that they apply to it. Of course, this very quickly highlights that it's still focusing me quite highly on the indenols, despite the fact that they're mostly good in terms of their, uh, their potency as opposed to their admin physicochemical properties. But it's very clearly indicating that um, if I wanted to start triaging on the basis of the chemical series, um, the first thing to do was would be to step away from the alkyl amines and aryl piperidines because they aren't promising in terms of that overall balance of properties, despite there being some, some potent compounds in there. So start up yourselves. If any of you don't um, would like to know a bit more about the different things I've sort of just touched on there, please do feel free to get in touch with us. But otherwise, I, I wanted to jump back to my presentation really just to wrap up with one or two conclusions. I hope what I demonstrated in that sort of last little sort of demo I did there is that MPO is a very powerful approach for selecting and designing high quality compounds. Um, it enables us to quickly target compounds that have the greatest chance of success and particularly allows us to, to try to avoid missed opportunities, which can be incredibly costly. And whatever approach you do take to MPO, you need to be aware of the limitations of the drug discovery data you're working with, both in terms of the relevance of the data to the ultimate sort of drug of interest or the, the target of interest, but also the uncertainty in the data, which is present for all but the simplest of properties. But of course, if we take a, a balanced strategy as sort of showed in the case study, um, hopefully that, that, that sort of demonstrated how we can dramatically reduce the time and resources required for whatever compound optimization we're doing. So as I mentioned before, I've got a, a few different um, references here for, to go into much more detail on some of these different approaches to MPO. But otherwise, I want to say thank you very much for, for taking the opportunity to, to join today's webinar. And if anyone has any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. Ed, thank you for, for this great presentation. Um, um, and I would like to, to open the session for questions. I see the first questions are rolling in, but just to, to remind you, please use the questions panel in the, in the control interface to type in your questions. While I give you a couple of seconds to, to type these questions in, I just want to, to uh, briefly come back to Stardrop. You, you have seen throughout the, the demonstration and for many of the, um, the images in the presentation, it has been using Stardrop. And I know most of you are familiar with Stardrop, but just in case you would like to, um, to learn more about Stardrop, please uh, either visit us on our webpage, optibrium.com, or get in touch with us um, via our email address, info at optibrium.com. And with that, we are finally opening the, the question session. And uh, the first question we have here is one um, concerning categorical data. At, during your presentation, you had mentioned categorical data, but how do we work with categorical data in scoring profiles? 
so the categorical data drops in just as easily as, as measured data. Um, it's sort of based on the idea that for any of the categories that we're feeding in, we've got um, some kind of estimate of the probability of that, that category being correct. But for all of the categories we've, we have in our, for, for a particular property, we can define how successful we'll think we'll be, we'll be with our project if we get that particular category of data. Um, and of course, if we have multi-category, if we obviously two, two category models are simple, but even if you have four, five, six, seven category models, um, you can still reflect uh, the likelihood of success for all, all of the different categories and, and generate a score in exactly the same way. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Um, the next question here is, how would you tweak the approach you just have showed um, to, to, to work with in silico virtual screens that have no measured data? Um, so you can apply, I mean, essentially my, my case study was based upon doing exactly that at the very beginning. So we started off using virtual compounds, generated predictions. Um, what you need to allow for then is when you're making selections after you've scored the compounds, um, you want to allow for the fact there's going to be a lot of uncertainty there. Um, so you, you wouldn't want to be just picking out the, the top two or three compounds and assuming they must be the best because there's going to be huge overlap between error bars. As, as I really had there, I only had one measured property in my profile. So even if that measured property wasn't there, I'm not going to get a wildly different um, profile that, from, from what we saw. But essentially, you can use any combination of measured or predicted data within these profiles. Clearly, what you want to use the highest quality data you have available. Um, uh, but essentially, whatever data you're using for making decisions, feed that into the profile. Thank you, Ed. The next question is um, concerning the, the errors in the HERC and solubility, which were much greater than in the log P and, and the total uh, polar surface area. Um, once measured HERC and solubility values are generated, how can I find the errors um, where MCU is greater than expected? Essentially, for, for something like, for some of the simple properties, clearly we get, um, well, for the simplest of properties, we may have no error whatsoever in them at all. That, that's, that's great. Um, whereas certainly something like your solubility or HERG is, is going to be a, a, a much bigger um, error in those values. Um, so it's not so much a case of relying on them or not relying on them. What you'll find is the score reflects that uncertainty back to you. You'll find that you won't get such big um, differences between compounds. If you just score compounds based purely upon perfect data, you, you'd find you get much more like step, steps, differences between the compound scores, whereas the errors mean that you really can't distinguish with confidence one way or the other in terms of comparing the actual value to the desirability function that you've, you've set up. So it's not so much that they, they can't be used, but you'll find it's harder to distinguish the, the overall score. So you need to be gentler in your triaging at the end to allow for the fact that the data you've got available really don't penalize or don't allow you to penalize compounds as, as heavily as you as you might like. But that's no reason not to use them. Obviously if the, the assays are really low quality and you are not telling you anything at all, then perhaps you shouldn't be using them as part of your decision making at all. So for all of the predicted properties, you obviously want to be comfortable that the, the models are predictive for your compounds. And that goes back to the question about chemical space. So um, the star drop models will will reflect that in the uncertainties uh, that come out. Um, but clearly, if you're if you're way out of the chemical space, then you probably want to be thinking about using um, sort of ideally better properties or properties in which you're more confident, as you wish to distinguish between more compounds with um, in, in a stricter way. Let's say. Perfect. And here's another question, which is related to that one. In this case, it's, it's about how reliable the, the log S predictions are, and I guess that ties into domains of applicability and such. It does, certainly. So, um, as, as you saw, for, for some of those compounds, the, the star drop sort of is estimating a, an error of around 0.7 log units, and then for some other compounds, one log unit. So what it, what it was doing was looking at how similar those compounds were to the training set of the model. For those that were nicely in the middle of the training set or in the chemical space, let's say, of the training set, because um, none of these compounds were actually in the training set, I should say, it, it was saying that we're getting an error around sort of three quarters of a log unit. For those that were closer to the edge of that chemical space, we're up to sort of a log unit. Um, so for any any compound you throw at these, star drop, these particular models, 
would look at the compound and compare it to the chemical space of the model. If you're outside the space, you'd see it gives a, a huge error associated with the prediction. You always get a prediction out, but it will give you a huge error. So the scoring would wrap that in. Um, now, of course, for, for any, any one person, I, I couldn't say how well the models will work for your chemistry, um, because I, I don't know that the chemistry you're working in. Um, we certainly build these models to cover as wide a variety of, um, of chemical space as we possibly can. But you need to think about that, have a look at that error when you're thinking about your, your comparison or when you're analysing the results that, that come out of this. But certainly the scoring will take that into consideration regardless. Perfect. Thanks, Ed. The next one is, what do I do with missing data points? Howell, so one of the nice things about my, my example there was that I had a beautifully full data set. Of course, that's that's not a reflection on the reality because typically you're going to have quite a sparse data set. There'll be some compounds you've run through certain assays. Obviously, for in silico data, you can always generate nice full columns of information, but assay data doesn't work the same way. The scoring works regardless of whether or not you've got missing data. It will actually reflect back to you the fact that there are um, there were missing values in sort of a visual indicator with the scores, but the scores themselves are just as valid. What you'll find is that a missing data point um, will be penalized compared to a really high quality data point, which meets the criteria you're looking for, or will get you a better score than compounds which are poor, which are definitely not what you're looking for, essentially putting you somewhere in the middle. So it'll treat it as though you've got a, a value with a huge uncertainty around it. So it doesn't can't really tell one way or the other. So um, yeah, it, it makes no difference to your ability to use scoring because most data sets have, have missing data in them and it, it'll still work just as well for helping you focus on, on the compounds that are most promising based upon what you currently know. Perfect, thanks Ed. The next one is when, edi when editing the scoring profile, how can I choose the value of the importance for a series of data? So how do I, express the, the notion of importance so the, the importance itself is is really the way to think about the importance is that it's linked to the penalty you're going to apply if you don't get the property that you're looking for and you want to think about each of the properties independently so if i were to think about importance is on a scale of from zero to one um, if i were to say well if i don't get the, the value i want for this property i've only got say a in my case i said a five percent chance success therefore i set a penalty um, which is sort of inversely related to that importance so the greater the penalty i'm applying um, the greater the importance so in my case i gave an importance of 0.95 which is um, sort of one minus the the 0 0.05 which was the the score i wanted to give those compounds that were going to fail so the, think about the importance in terms of the way to penalize compounds that don't get these criteria right because um, the high importance compounds should be the ones that you know are critical for success. They're the ones you really want to penalize when you don't get the values you need. Perfect. And then there's a question which is slightly outside of what you demonstrated today, but does Stardrop offer the option to augment the data set to improve the quality of the model? So it, there's probably a, a couple of different ways to answer that. So um, in terms of augmenting the data set, I presumably in terms of thinking about which compounds to measure in order to feed back into the model building process. So if I if I if that was the correct if I've interpreted the question correctly, um, that's actually something that we, we've covered in other webinars related to um, our sort of augmented chemistry platform and our Sorella. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, our, our Sorella system, which we're developing at the moment, um, which, which certainly gives feedback on which of the compounds and assays to run in order to give you the best chance of improving the overall predictions coming out of the system. So this is something that w works hand in hand with Starjob. Um, it's not a current feature of Starjob, but it's it's coming soon. Then maybe a quick performance question for startup. How much time does it take to run an optimization approximately for, let's say, a thousand compounds with uh, 15 endpoints ish? Uh, so in terms of running, the, the scoring itself is incredibly quick to run. What will take longer is perhaps running predictive models, but even for 
a small data set like a thousand compounds and 15 models, we're still only talking sort of matters of seconds to, to do this kind of thing. Um, but optimization is a very general word. So perhaps there was a particular aspect of optimization that you had in mind when you asked that. But certainly in terms of running models and, and scoring for data sets of that size, it's, it's very, very quick. As you saw, I had a data set of 300 compounds and the scores were with us in a second or so, assuming my screen didn't freeze at that point. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. And considering that we're in overtime, the, the last question for today, um, can we generate SAR using Stardrop? Absolutely. As, so there, there are a lot of features in Stardrop for exploring SAR, whether that's generating activity neighborhoods, activity landscapes. Um, we have our glowing molecule, which enables us to, to look in more detail about the relationship between properties um, and, and chemical structures. And as, as Tim touched on, there's a huge amount there in Stardrop. I, I really just focused on the MPO. Um, but if you're interested in, in that side of things, the SAR, I'm more than happy to um, sort of either, if, if you haven't already got Stardrop, um, sort of give you a demo bit and let, let you try it out or, and talk you through the possibilities there. So please get in touch and we can talk more about SAR. So there's, there's lots of tools in Stardrop for doing that. Thanks a lot, Ed. And I think with that, I would like to, to thank everyone who joined us today and for staying with us despite the, the internet gremlins, which was were, were disrupting us a bit today. And we hope to see you soon for, for our upcoming webinars and you will receive invitations to those via the, the usual channels. Otherwise, please follow us on, on LinkedIn um, or visit our webpage. Thanks again. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, John. And we hope to talk to you soon.